My topic is the financial crisis and the death of macroeconomics. Um, the topic reminds me of an old joke. Um, a Western observer uh, is at a Soviet May Day parade back in the 1980s. And um, it's, uh, the spectacle is overwhelming. He's, he's, he, it, the parade begins with uh, crack divisions of Red Army troops followed by battalions of, of these very mighty tanks, after which come huge long-range field artillery, rows and rows, followed by the nuclear missiles, okay, that are gleaming in the sun. After that, there's a small group of men, not in step at all, sort of puny, undistinguished looking, um, in ill-fitting suits. Uh, and the Western Observer is puzzled, and he turns to his Soviet hosts and he says, who or what is that? And they, and they respond, well, that's our most terrible and destructive weapon. Those are economists. <laughs> well, those are our macroeconomists in the United States. Okay. All right, so I'm here to, um, to, to, to support Gary North, what he said yesterday, um, in trumpeting the silver lining amid the gloom, the gloom and doom about the financial crisis. After a long and disreputable history of about 300 years, in my four words, macroeconomics is finally dead. Um, as, as, as Gary pointed out yesterday, its leading, leading proponents simply do not know what to do anymore. Uh, and they've said, so, they've said this in, in so many words. In fact, as Murray Rothbard, he actually, Murray's always been very, was always very insightful. And, and back in the 1980s, uh, after the um, short-lived uh, sort of attraction to monetarism died out because they had, had um, misforecast a recession that never occurred in 1984-85, uh, macroeconomics was really dead from the neck up. That was Murray's term. Okay, so it's really, since the 1980s, macroeconomics has been a zombie discipline. And I'm hoping that this crisis will finally put the zombie in its, gra its grave. Um, so let me just give you a, sh a very short um, paragraph on where macroeconomics came from. Where, where did it come from? Okay, most people think it started with John Maynard Keynes. People that are a little bit better informed talk about Irving Fisher as the true father of macroeconomics. He first came up with um, the quantity theory uh, formulated in um, an equation. But really, macroeconomics is a, is a crackpot uh, doctrine that came to life in 1705 in a, in a very slim book entitled Money and Trade Considered with a Proposal for Supplying the Nation with Money. The author of the book was a Scotsman. His name was John Law. He was a notorious character who was known throughout Europe as a gambler, philanderer, schemer, an escaped convict who had killed a man in a duel in London. He was also the first central banker. <laughs> True. In 1716, Law became the director of the Royal Bank of France and immediately enacted the principles set out in his book. In, in four short years, he created a massive inflationary bubble that left the French monetary system in ruins when it, when it finally burst. Um, that was the first ma macroeconomic crisis. There were many more to come. Um, I'm hoping that um, this one, the current one, will be our, our last. Okay. So now what I want to do is to... Um, set out the dimensions, briefly outline the dimensions of the financial crisis, and argue that it really is worse than we think because it brought about a great deal of, of overconsumption, capital destruction, malinvestment, um, and impoverishment that still has not been revealed. So let me just talk first about the money supply because it always starts with the money supply. Macroeconomics is simply the policy conclusion that spending more money can cure anything. Okay. And that's, it's been put in different language over the past 300 years, but that's, that, that's the germ of, of macroeconomics. So, so let's start the dot-com bubble. Okay, it burst in, in early 2000, leading to a, a, a recession in early 2001. The Fed reacted very aggressively by lowering the target Fed funds rate. The events of 9-11 led the Fed to ratchet up its expansionary monetary policy. From the beginning of 2001 to the end of 2005, 
Um, the Fed's, one of the Fed's monetary aggregates that I tend to look at, which is NZM, um, increased by about $1 billion per week. They were creating $1 billion new dollars in the American economy every week from 2001 to 2005, for five years. Uh, from the beginning of, um, also if we look, look at another one of their aggregates, M2, that increased by about $750 million per week. The monetary base, which is completely controlled by the Fed, increased by about $200 billion over those years, um, which was a cum cumulative increase of about 33%. The Fed funds rate was driven down below 2% and then held at 1% for almost three years. Um, yet inflation during this period was very moderate, okay? Uh, the CPI fluctuated between about 1% and 3%. However, since modern macroeconomists and central bankers tend to narrowly focus on consumer prices to, to determine whether there's inflation in the economy or not, they believe that the monetary policy had, their monetary policy had succeeded in stabilizing the economy after the dot-com bust. In fact, they congratulated themselves in the journals and, and, and papers that were, 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 were um, produced uh, by the various regional central banks. And they did this by claiming that they had achieved over the past 20 years a great moderation. In fact, what they had really done um, is to blow up a huge asset bubble that began in the 1990s and didn't come to an end until 2007, 2008. So let me just give you some uh, idea of the dimensions of this. OK, this is the Fed funds rate, which starting in 2000, quite high, it was over 6%. You can see how it was pushed down and we held at 1% there for a, a long while. Then it, Greenspan allowed it to, to rise, and that's when we began to get the um, end of the housing bubble. Okay. And now it's been pushed down again. As the recession took place, the gray bar represents the periods of recession. As recession took place, it was pushed down to between 0 and 0.25%. Here are the measures of the money stock. If you notice that um, both MZM and uh, M2 were just about $5, five trillion dollars in 2001 or so. Okay, uh, today MZM is uh, between nine and uh, between nine and ten trillion dollars. M2, so uh, representing almost a, a doubling of the money supply in, in 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 about nine years. Okay, so it's a massive increase in the money supply. One thing you should notice is that both of the of these aggregates began to flatten out in about mid-2009. We haven't had much monetary growth during that period. We've had qualitative easing. But now they're threatening us with quantitative easing again. Qualitative easing simply means socializing the financial system, okay? Trading government assets for, for bad assets, taking over financial institutions, and so on. Quantitative easing simply means printing money. Okay, so we're going to be back to printing money again. Those lines are going to start to rise again very soon. And then this is consumer price inflation, which shows that from, 2000, from, from 1990 or so, um, through except for short periods, it, it, it fluctuated between um, 3%, 1 and 3%. You can see the, and then, then shot up um, right at, at, as, as the recession hit. Okay. But for the most part, it was fairly moderate by historical standards. Now let's talk a little bit about the mortgage market. Um, as many Austrians pointed out at the time, the wildly expansionary monetary policy had ignited a boom in asset prices, especially in the real estate and stock markets. Rates on 30-year conventional mortgages fell, from, fell sharply from over 7% in 2002 to a low of 5.25% in 2003, and then fluctuated between 55 and 6% until late 2005. But this wasn't really the important story. The important story, and, and what was more significant, was that one-year adjusted rate mortgages, their rates plummeted from a high of 7.1% uh, in 2000 to a low, they were almost cut in half, of 3.75% in 2003. And then they rose to about 4% 4, 4 and, and stayed there but, um, for 2004 and 2005. In addition, and importantly, credit standards were loosened and unconventional mortgages, including interest-only 
negative equity, and no down payment mortgages proliferated. This caused a rapid expansion of mortgage lending and especially of subprime mortgage lending. The subprime share of the mortgage market um, rose from 8.62% in 2000 to about 13.5% in 2005. So, yeah, tremendous increase in subprime loans. Also, housing prices accelerated to double-digit annual increases after, uh, after a short disinflation that we had um, during the 2001 recession. That is, housing prices didn't come down in 2001. They stopped increasing as rapidly as they had been in the 1990s. Okay. The housing boom soon turned into uh, a bubble as, as people's expectations lost all contact with fundamentals. People who could not afford houses of, of certain prices were simply buying them because they knew they could sell those houses at much higher prices in the future and then move on to a high, uh, uh, an even higher priced house. Um, by mid-2003, the stock price prices began to go up. We, we began to get um, a, a big bull market. Okay? Let me just, again, give you some of the figures here, or some of the pictures. Um, this is the 30-year mortgage rate, which was pushed sharply down from over 8% in 2000, and then fluctuated around 6%, and then went up to around 7% um, right before the, 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 the um, bursting of the bubble. Housing prices, as you can see, um, rose tremendously from uh, January. If you take that as 100, they rose by 120, 120% in the top, uh, I'm sorry, by, yeah, 120% um, in, 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 in 10 leading cities and by about 100% in, in, in 20 leading cities, okay? And just to give you an idea of the rates of change, housing prices were rising um, in 2004, and running up to 2004 by 15 to 20 percent every year they were going up, okay? And again, this is for selected 10 and 20 cities, okay? And, and the housing crisis did not affect, the housing bubble did not affect the whole country. It affected um, some, some larger cities and metropolitan areas. Now, what's important is what was the effect on household net, net worth, worth? Because this is sometimes called a balance sheet um, recession but it was also a balance sheet bubble. Um, the sharply rising stock and real estate prices boosted household net worth by over $23 trillion during just three years, from 2003 to 2006. This drove the ratio of household net worth to annual GDP to well over 450%. So let me just show you that. Um, what I want to show you. Well, this is just the increases in the, um, the Dow Jones, okay, but... Okay, here's the household net worth. You can see that in 2002, it's about $40 trillion. That includes um, all financial assets and real estate assets minus the debts owned by households. So it went from $40 trillion all the way up to $63 trillion in 2005 and 2006. Okay, it's $23 trillion. What did that do? That gave a tremendous impetus to people to begin using their houses as ATM machines and to engage in all sorts of luxury consumption and consumption that under more realistic circumstances um, and under more realistic ca calculations they would have never undertaken. So it set off a huge consumption boom. Now historically, the percent of, of a total household net worth as a percent of GDP was about 350%. If you go back, all the way back to 1992, um, it fluctuated about 350%, between 300 and 350%. Suddenly, notice how it sharply rises with the, uh, the bubble, uh, the first bubble, the dot-com bubble in 1995, rise up to 450, falls during our recession of 2000, 2001, back to almost normal levels, and then shoots up to over 450%, to 475% of income, okay? And then again, later crashes, which, which we'll talk about. Okay, so I can say, I point out by comparison for over 40 years from 1952 until the dot-com crash began in the mid-1990s, the household net worth to annual GDP ratio had held between 300% and 350%. After nearly falling back to this range, as I pointed out, in the recession of 2001, the Fed's monetary expansion drove it up by 100 percentage points in a matter of three years, okay? 
created $23 trillion of, of, of net worth, all of which was false, all of which was phony, all of which misled people and misdirected their purchases and caused what we call an overconsumption boom. Um, so the enormous increase in net worth was based almost solely on paper profits and phantom capital gains on households, real estate, and financial assets. People were misled by the, the inflation bloated balance sheets to cash out some of their home, home equity and increase expenditures on consumer goods and services. And as we know, in the expression of the day, people began using their houses as ATM machines. Households finance the increased spending on boats, luxury autos, upscale restaurant meals, pricey vacations, and so on through fixed dollar debt. This created a huge consumption boom as monthly real expenditures on retail and food services rose from an average of $160 billion per month between 2000 and 2003 to $180 billion through 2008. Okay, so there's, there's a consumption boom. Okay. Going from $160 billion, okay, and actually you can see it going through the 90s, it's a huge consumption boom, okay? And it, it was intensified after, after, after the uh, recession of 2001 by the Fed pouring a billion dollars a week into the economy. And by people thinking that they were wealthier than they really were. This is what has, has occurred during um, the, the boom and the bust. Um, during the boom, you had falsification of monetary calculation. So it's not just capital misdirected, but people begin to, uh, they begin to, to misinterpret what prices are telling them. Okay? And, and as we'll see, it takes a long time to regain faith in the price system after you've had a crash. After everything you've done, which seemed like the right thing to do given the circumstances, suddenly turns out to be completely wrong. Here's what happens to personal saving rate. Why save if you're gaining trillions of dollars a year in stocks, in your 401k, in, 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 in your house, houses. So the saving rate um, in the US fell from um, around 4 or 5%, even higher if you go back into the 90s. But by, by 2000, it was around 4%. Uh, it, it declined all the way to less than 1% in 2005. Okay? Were consumers just being profligate? Were they not worried about their futures? No, they, they felt that their futures were secured by the fact of this huge increase in net worth that they could depend on for their old age. And fortunately, people came to their senses and began to save much more money out of their current accounts, okay, uh, rising up to 7% and then 8% by the end of the recession. Okay? And by the way, this troubles the Fed. We have too much saving. Okay. Morons. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let me just say a few words. Um, the household debt. Thus, well, household ha assets rose by 21, over $21 trillion from 2003 to 2007. Liabilities, mainly home mortgages and consumer credit, increased by $4 trillion during the same period. Okay, now, the collapse from $21 trillion, uh, back by $21 trillion, of course, then made this, this increase in, in, in fixed liabilities. The, the new $4 trillion that they, they had in, in fixed dollar liabilities made it much more burdensome. Okay? One of the results of this was that the year-over-year -year rate of growth of household debt nearly doubled from 6% during 1997 to 11% for three consecutive years beginning in mid-2003. Okay? So the household debt outstanding is up around 11%, okay? And that's um, on the um, right axis. And when the boom came to an end in 2007, housing prices, corporate profits, and markets plunged. The capital gains accumulated since the mid-1990s were revealed to be an illusion. This is interesting. Household net worth, okay, the value of your house and, and, and your financial assets, um, of all Americans, declined by $13 trillion, okay, or 20% during one year alone, 2008. That $13 trillion is a figure exceeding the sum of the combined annual GDP of Germany, Japan, and the UK, okay? That dis wealth disappeared into thin air. It was actually never there. People thought it was there, okay? This brought the overconsumption frenzy, which had begun in the mid-1990s, to a screeching halt. 
All right, let me say a few words about the retail slump. One of the most important features of the current recession in the U.S. has been the exceptionally severe retail slump. In the old days during recessions, you didn't have retail stores going out of business. You had construction companies. You had steel companies laying off workers. You had interest-sensitive consu consumer goods like automobiles cutting back. But you didn't have um, linens and things or, or uh, some of the other. Uh, in fact, let me, let me just give you some of the qualitative dimensions of this. Um, the current retail, uh, Chrysler filed um, Chapter 11 on April, uh, April 11th, uh, followed by GM on June 1st. This is in 2009. Uh, KB Toys, one of the largest U.S. toy retailers, sought Chapter 11 protection in December 2008 and announced that it was planned to close all of its 460 retail outlets. Circuit City, the second largest electronic retailer in the U.S., declared bankruptcy and closed all 575 of its stores that year. Mid-sized electronics retailer, CompUSA, closed all 103 of its outlets. Sharper Image, a novelty and electronics retailer, was also, has also declared bankruptcy. Linen and Things, the second largest home goods retailer in the U.S., filed Chapter 11 and is liquidating its 371 stores. Fortunovs, um, a leading, one of my wife's favorites, a leading jewelry and home furnishing chain in the Northeast, filed for bankruptcy, as did mid-sized furniture retailers Levitz and Bombay, both of which are liquidating. Many more retail uh, chains are scrapping expansion plans and proceeding with massive cuts, or, or have done that, um, including Disney, Ann Taylor, Foot Locker, and many, many others. You didn't have these things happening in early recessions because you didn't have the massive um, bubble that, that, that created all of this false wealth that people re had reacted to. And I had, have some um, statistics here on um, the... Uh, quantitative dimensions of, of the slump. I'll just, I'll just read one or two of them. Um, for, for December 2008, the year-over-year -year decline in current dollar sales was 11.1%, and from January through July 2009, these year-over-year -year declines fluctuated between 8.5 and 10.5%. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, except for two non-consecutive months during the recession of 1990-1991, in which monthly retail sales dip slightly below zero in a year-over-year -year basis, one would have to go back to 1960-61 to find declines in actual dollars spent on consumption goods okay, um, during a recession. Okay. Retail sales also took an exceptionally, um, real retail sales also took an exceptionally sharp plunge during this recession. Um, they declined from $180 billion on a monthly basis, which I talked about uh, in 2006-2007, to 160 billion, trillion, a billion, okay? Um, if you compare this to, to uh, the current recession, to all recessions, all other recessions, beginning with 1960-61, the monthly percent change in re real retail sales from a year ago fell by 8% um, for only three months. Out of all the past recessions going back to 1960-61, you had re real retail sales falling for only three months, and that all happened in the mini recession of 1980, and they weren't consecutive. By contrast, during the current recession, real retail sales on a year-over-year -year basis have contracted by 8% for nine consecutive months, um, which ended in 2009. Overall, they contracted, they were negative for 23 consecutive months. Okay. All right, let me just jump ahead here. Um, that shows you the dimension of the, um, something that no one expected, and that was the, the um, retail boom, or a uh, boom and, and um, slump. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about capital consumption, which I think is the fallout from all of this. The extent of capital consumption and malinvestment that resulted from the housing boom is revealed by developments in the Wilshire 5000 Total Market Index. This index tracks the total dollar value of all U.S. headquartered equity securities with readily available price data. So it's basically the total capitalization of all the firms headquartered in the U.S. minus that, uh, the, the capital that was invested by bondholders. So it's, 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 it's using the total stock capitalization. It's using total stock value as a, as a proxy for the total capital of all our firms. Um, after reaching a high of $15.5 trillion in 2007, okay, the index collapsed and fell to a low of $8 trillion dollars in 1997. So there, there you have um, almost $16 trillion 
and it fell all the way to eight trillion. Okay, it has since recovered and has been languishing around eleven trillion dollars, eleven and a half trillion dollars. Now, what does that mean? Um, the first time that the Wilshire Five Thousand reached eleven thousand, eleven trillion dollars was back in 1997. What does that tell you? That there's been no capital accumulation since 1997. That any capital that was accumulated after that point was destroyed by malinvestment, investing in the wrong lines, and overconsumption. People um, consuming their capital, consuming their savings. Okay. And here, now we can talk a little bit about the death of macroeconomics. It may happen that even the level of wealth and income um, that, that we think we have now is based on false calculations because the Fed and the U.S. Treasury, which is a fiscal agent of the U.S. government, have used every tool at their disposal and even forged some new ones in order to prop up housing and financial asset prices. Okay, So we have a bunch of things here. Um, well, this is percent changes in the Wilshire. You don't have to worry about that. Um, the federal deficit, see it way down there in the corner, you probably can't. The fe federal deficit uh, for uh, fiscal year 2009 was $1.4 trillion and is on target for $1.2 trillion for this fiscal year um, and with trillions of dollars of deficits each year being forecast down the road, as, as Gary North pointed out yesterday. The gross federal debt has risen from around $4 trillion uh, in... Well, I'm sorry, uh, around $6 trillion in 2001, all the way up to nearly $14 trillion, $10 trillion in addition to federal debt. Now, the gross federal debt, um, that's the gross federal debt. The amount of the debt held by private investors, okay, $4 trillion is held by government agencies, and that we don't have to worry about that because if we have a just world or eventually we, we bring about a world uh, of, of a free market economy. You can cancel all that debt that's held by government agencies. But private investors hold $8 trillion, $4 trillion of which is held by foreign investors. So we're on the hook to pay interest on, on this debt and eventually the principal. The Fed's attempt at qualitative e easing, which is, as I said, is a euphemism for nationalizing the financial institutions, has resulted in its balance sheet rising from $800 billion to $2.2 trillion just in the fall of 2008. Very colorful here. So this is all of, see the, the blue is at the bottom is the traditional security holdings, government securities. They added lending to financial institutions, this is qualitative e easing, liquidity to key markets, federal, Fed agency debt, mortgage-backed securities purchases, okay? So it, it jumped from under $1 trillion to um, $2.2 trillion, okay? And the mar now, the market's not buying this. I mean, th this hasn't, this hasn't got us, got us back on track. Um, despite all of the stimulus programs and the alphabet soup of qualitative easing programs, TAF, TARP, CALF, PPIP, FASP, AMLEF, and so on, the U.S. economy is mired in a stalled recovery um, caused by what Gary called broken confidence and Bob Higgs calls regime uncertainty. Despite the quantitative easing and the qualitative easing the Fed has done, that the Fed has done and the stimulus programs, the deficit spending, no one is willing to borrow and invest because they do not know the economic consequences of all these programs and the other government programs, such as cap and trade, Dodd-Frank bill, and Obamacare that are scheduled to be implemented. No one knows the, the effects of this. Um, there's a great graph by Steve Hankey here. Um, I'll, I'll quickly describe it and give you one more graph and I'll end. Um, as Hanky points out, the Fed has increased the money supply, so it's increased its own, the very bottom of, 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 this of this triangle, the lower triangle is from August of 2008. What you can see there is that the Fed has about $800 billion in monetary base, and the money supply measured by M2 is $7.8 trillion. Now, that has grown from August 2008 to August 2010, or to June 2010. Um, the, the, the base has more than doubled, and the money supply has increased from 7.8 to 8.6 trillion dollars. However, what has not grown, what has shrunk, is borrowing, is, 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 is the extent to which people are willing to take on new debt. This is what is stalling us. Um, so shadow banks, that is the fin broad financial system, 
um, their, the credit extended by, the, by, by this sector has fallen from 16 trillion to 13 trillion. Um, the international positions of, of, of banks, those US dollar deposits outside the US, has fallen from 13.2 trillion um, to 12.2 trillion dollars. Okay, so that's fallen. Um, and finally, the derivatives, okay, the, 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 the um, over the counter derivatives, have fallen from 684 trillion to 615 trillion. So the Fed is pushing money out, but the market's not taking it. The investors, well, let's put it this way. The, the banks don't trust the investors. They don't trust the um, businesses. They, they don't believe that, they don't have confidence that, that, that there's solvent business or that, that businesses out there have good plans for, for investment. The investors themselves aren't taking the loans because they don't see profit opportunities. And they don't see profit opportunities because they believe that we're going to have higher taxes because of, the, of all the programs that the government has implemented, as well as, 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 as the pending programs that will be implemented in the future, as well as, of course, the, the deficit uh, and, and the huge debt that we're facing. So the uh, U.S. credit triangle is, is shrinking, and the market's causing it to shrink. Okay? And that's, that's a good thing, because entrepreneurs are stepping back and making sure that before they do anything, prices and costs are aligned properly, that there are pro true prospects for profits. What the Fed has to do is to step away. The government has to step away. They have to allow the adjustment to occur. And this, I think, this last um, graph shows us um, the death of macroeconomics. Okay? As you'll notice, I, the black line is the federal deficit. Okay? Um, the, the, the red line is the Fed funds rate. Now, as they move down, the deficit gets larger as the black line moves down, and the Fed fund rate, funds rate gets lower as the, as, the, as the red line moves down. That means that we have more spending and more money creation. But notice what happens to the blue line. Every time the two, the, the monetary policy line and the uh, fiscal policy line move down, as, that is, as we get, every time we get more deficits uh, or greater deficits and lower interest rates, what happens to the blue line? The unemployment line goes up, okay? So everything they're doing is having the opposite of effect to, the, to their intentions or to, to their stated intentions. In fact, recently uh, in May in the AER, there was an article by a University of Chicago economist, Harold Hulig, that pointed out that for every new dollar of government stimulus spending, there's a destruction of $3.40 of, of, of real output in our economy. So um, I'm happy to report that um, it looks like macroeconomics is on its last legs and that, you know, hopefully it will be put in its grave. We just have to say, we knew this was coming as Austrians. We told you so. Here are the reasons. Okay? And, and here are the data. Okay. So thank you.